Welcome back to the Ben Stewart Podcast, everybody. Today is a really exciting day. We have somebody that I have been following for quite some time since I worked at Gaia. His name is William Henry. He's a Nashville-based author, an investigative mythologist, art historian, and TV presenter. He's an internationally recognized authority on human spiritual potential, transformation, and ascension. Consulting producer of the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, host of the Gaia TV series The Awakened Soul, and did an excellent presentation that I loved watching, and I even used a clip of on Beyond Belief, uh, George Nouri's show on Gaia, at the Conscious Life Expo 2020, called I Am Plus, Your Brain, the Body of Light, and the Art of Science and of Living Ascension. Over 30 years of research distilled into 18 books and numerous video presentations, a lot of which are on Gaia. But the one I'm truly appreciated most recently was how deeply he covered AI and transhumanism in his free ebook, The Skingularity Is Near. That's right, I said Skingularity Is Near. Um, the subtitle is The Next Human, The Perfect Rainbow Light Body, and the Technology of Human Transcendence. Today we're going to cover something that you've heard us cover before on the show, and that's the holy anointing oil from the Bible, and in this context of our era of AI and UFO disclosure. So let's get right to it and welcome William Henry onto the show on Ben Stewart Podcast. Thank you, Ben. So great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, William. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. This is really exciting. I've been following your work for, for quite some time. And really, it's it's great to see that you have been doing this research for as long as you've been doing. And the fact that we are, I mean, I think you were writing about transhumanism in 2002 in a context yeah. that nobody back then was really even writing about all of that in. I would love to know your journey that brings you to that point to really wrap spirituality with what's happening in tech. I would love to know just mm -hmm. the journey that got you to that point where you became interested in it. All right. Well, yeah, thank you. And thank you for, for uh, mentioning that. I guess the, the place to start would be mid nineties. I'm uh, researching everything from the, the Holy grail to the staff of Moses and I get fixated on this cloak or garment that I kept seeing passed around in the ancient world that the gods and the angels would would wear this this garment of light that gave them these sort of superpowers like like Superman's cape kind of a thing. And I just kind of started pulling on the thread of that that garment, pun intended. And then really uh, around the first of the, uh, the new millennium, 2000 or so, started assembling it into uh, what became my book, The Cloak of the Illuminati, which was a book in which I just documented uh, for a period of several thousand years or over a period of several thousand years that the transmission of this cloak or garment of light. And as I'm getting ready to, to, uh, to publish that book in, in 2002, I, I learn of a U.S. government report put out by the U.S. Department of Commerce, where they gathered all the, the big tech swingers that were in existence back in, in 2002 and brought them together and said, some of you are, are working with computer technology or bits. Some of you are working with nanotechnology or at the atomic level, atoms. Some of you are working in neuroscience and some of you are working in genetics. And what the De Department of Commerce said is they wanted those corporations to merge all of those technologies into one technology that was ultimately going to be aimed at the human skin. And the human body would be a new platform for technological development. And the purpose of this unification of these technologies, as the Department of Commerce said in this report, was to, which they titled on converging technologies, the purpose of it was to create wealth beyond imagination and to introduce a new golden age in which a new type of human would begin to walk the earth, one that is merged with these technologies. And as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, that this is exactly the, the same cloak or garment that the ancients were always talking about, only now, where instead of doing it organically, we're going to attempt to do this through technology. And that became the conclusion of my book. And that, that last chapter in that book then became the, the starting point of, of research that I continue to do to this day, 20 years later. 
I would love to understand a little bit more about that because I've, and we've talked about on this show before, um, the internet of bodies. And I know you mm-hmm. spoke about that at the 2020 conscious life expo. I really appreciated right. that. Um, when you say, and I, I want to check this out on converging technologies. I want to check that out. But when you say aiming this technology at the skin, um, for the audience, maybe dig a little deeper. Is is that metaphorical? Is it very literal? I'm I'm sure it has a bit of both as no. well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because what they started to describe was actually a uh, an exoskeleton that would be developed for and by the U.S. military, uh, which soon uh, took precedence after this report came out. Um, and, and when we circle back after a little bit, I want to mention that there was another NASA report that was also put out during the same time that advocated this shift into a, a transhuman body where we'd create these robotic doubles for ourselves, dolls, in other words, and that what they were seeking to do ultimately was to put this technology in the skin that the wearable phase as we were we've entered into now was known about back then they knew they would develop this exoskeleton similar to what iron man wore Mm. um and that the the ultimate aim was to go in the skin um and about iron man it, it ended up that i was a consultant for robert downey jr on that movie because he read my book, Cloak of the Illuminati, and was like, dude, you, the, what you wrote about is exactly the suit I'm going to be wearing, and I need your help with this. Wow. Wow. That's that's pretty impressive, and that's well before the time that anyone, I mean, anyone that I know at least was really talking about these things. So I'm no, really it glad. Was, you- I was kind of a out in the wilderness kind of thing. And, you know, I remember being doing radio shows saying, look, this is what they're planning on doing. And then they're going to create replacement humans. And people thought, you know, this is nuts. You know, you're like David Icke, David Icke's talking about maybe an implant or something like that, but you're talking about a full, a new, new skin for humanity, merging us with this technology and then creating duplicates or replicas of ourselves. Yeah, so um, not sure if you have uh, seen. I like to watch through some shows that that um, shows or movies that kind of take a, a peek a little bit forward into where we may be headed. There was this show called Art Altered Carbon, where um, oh, yeah. everybody mm-hmm. basically bodies were called sleeves, and your yeah. humanness was held in in what's called a stack, and it's at it's right above the atlas bone or something along those lines. And that was mm-hmm. that was that story. Um, there it is up on the screen. And and then now we have Ready Player One, um, yep. which is different. You know, like that's more virtual reality based and it, it it's not as forward looking. But it also shows that right around the corner, we're definitely headed into a world where, you know, technology and biology, th- there's not much of a separation anymore. And no, um, no. what's her name? Allison McDowell. Uh, has been talking yes. about the the colonization down to our very biology, where the nanotechnology uh, and what's being created now, and and I, I leave a little bit of room. It, I, I have such massive reservations that I have to keep reminding myself. Leave a little bit of room for for seeing the way this is playing out as something that is also telling a story of what humanity craves, but it, it definitely right. seems to me as you know, when when you were saying that in the early days they were talking about creating immeasurable wealth, I'm sure maybe you didn't even see the, the writing on the wall, or maybe you did a completely digital, um, uh, like crypto, completely digital economy. And now moving into what's yeah. Web3, we're, we're talking right. about, I mean, there's digital assets upwards of $650,000 super yacht that's just a digital mm-hmm. asset sold uh, by, I think it's... Um, Republic realm or something like that. Yeah. This is taking yeah. hold a lot, maybe not quicker than I thought, because I can see why it's it's headed in this direction. But it's really it's right. touching every single sector, and it does kind of seem like 2020, if not intimately linked with the 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 global scenario beforehand, was was a major opportunist saying, well, this is our opportunity to 
shut down the economy, switch it from shareholder uh, economy to stakeholder economy, and really start moving into this thing called the the Great Reset. I would love to know your thoughts right. on on like what happened what happened circa the end of 2019 2020 in in your mind and how is this uh, how and why is this pressing the gas towards yeah. technology specifically we're, we're talking about a, a virus okay. and and it's right. and now most everything we're talking about is technology based so and then right. we'll start getting yeah, into exactly. the articles that you sent me as well okay sure sure um so just going back to our timeline so i'm working throughout the, 2008 to 2012 on Iron Man and still messing around with, with Robert Downey Jr. working on projects. And here comes the big transformation of 2012. You know, it's going to be the end of the world. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's a transformative moment. Where are we going? Well, I, I kept during that period saying, look, it's all about our merger with technology. This is where it's going. Okay, and it's coming fast. And, the, and back in 2002, they had the Department of Commerce said 2035 was their target date for mm. this new human to be walking around. Okay, so back in 2002, it's like, wow, that's 33 years away. You know, uh, we can chill out a little bit, but not really because it's coming quick. And so 2000, what, 15 or so, we start getting the, 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 the real serious vibe from the World Economic Forum. Klaus Schwab is putting out books. You've got this Russian billionaire that's proposing that we start uh, developing our avatar bodies and shifting out of our biological or organic selves into avatar beings. And this is becoming a really big part of the conversation. And this is what my, my work is focused on during that time. And I'm saying, look, here's the hope. The hope is that people are, are rejecting the VR goggles. Every business trade paper, every website was saying, VR is, is just not happening. People, it's like uh, those dork Google Glass, uh, that concept. It didn't fly. People rejected it, right? And VR was on its way out. And then, as you're saying, Ben, here, here we, that, that's it, up until February 2020. That was, that was my platform. And then here comes COVID. Immediately, instantly, overnight, everything goes virtual vir instantly. And now, less than two years later, Facebook changed their name to Meta. They're, they're, they're shoving the metaverse down our throat. People are realizing there's a, another reality intermingling within ours. But what they don't realize is that it's driven by the US military, and this has been planned. And I say it's been planned because the other piece to this puzzle was put out in the year 2000, two years before the Department of Commerce report by a NASA high priest named Dr. Dennis Bushnell, <laughs> excuse me, who laid out the timeline from NASA's perspective. He is, uh, excuse me, just gonna take a sip. Sure, yeah, no worries. Dennis Bushnell is in Orlando, Florida with everyone from Raytheon to Northrop Grumman to everybody saying, look, here's the future of humanity. For 10,000 years, we were hunter gatherers. And then came the Industrial Revolution. Now comes the, <coughs> excuse me, the Infocogno Revolution, which is that bit the Department of Commerce was talking about. And what he said in 2000 was, is that the, the next phase after the Infocogno was the virtual world and started showing and, and saying, look, we're, this is what NASA, this is what the U.S. government's going to be writing contracts for. Boys and girls, go get busy in your lab. We're starting to, we're going to create a virtual world once again so that we can create trillions of dollars. So in both instances, they're talking about human transformation, directed evolution for dollars. And that's what it's all about for these people. But um, looking at it from uh, a spiritual religious perspective, as I always have, it's very clear that what we're actually dealing with is an anti-human force on this planet that seeks to transform the human race in order not to advance it, but ultimately, I believe, to eliminate it. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, this is one thing that I've really appreciated about your work was the, the spiritual side of it and the hopeful element that you have for it. Mm -hmm. And in The Skingularity is Near, I really appreciated a lot of how you would bring to light. I think there was this one piece of art, and I love the fact that you focus on um, art and really break it down, but there was this mm -hmm. one where um, there was 
a, a noise, like a trumpeting that was coming from heaven and half the people mm -hmm. were in fear and, and the other half were, right. I would say, I guess, more accepting of it or kind of adapted right. to it. Right. I mean, this evolutionary impulse, we, we don't know exactly where it's coming from, but my sense is, my intuition says that it's it's otherworldly, it's extraterrestrial. There is a, mm. a more advanced race on this planet that is feeding uh, uh, DARPA, NASA technology for the transformation of the human race, but there's also technologically uh, uh, transforming us, but there's also that spiritual force that wants to see us to progress organically. And this is what we re refer to as the ascension process. And this is the, what is unfolding right now on our planet is this, this bifurcation of the race. Will we remain organic and spiritual beings or will we yield to the, the powers that be that want to see us eliminate our religion, eliminate our spirituality, our individ individuality, and just become part of the internet of bodies? Yeah, yeah. Have you seen um, slated for what was it next year? It's a one world religion headquarters uh, set at least at first to kind of mend the bond between Christianity and uh, Islam. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I didn't. Mm -mm. Well, that's. I mean, that's that's just one thing that I'm seeing with this, and I've I've I'm, I was doing a talk in Australia back in twenty. 11, I believe it was. And I wasn't even sure when, when somebody was asking me, where do you think we are headed as a species? I said, I, I think mm -hmm. we're splitting in two, but I had no technological sense. I, I had no sense that it was going to be as technological as it is. And you're I, definitely right, right that there's a big push from the military. There's this book called Surveillance Valley. And Surveillance mm -hmm. Valley basically just shows that Silicon Valley from its inception all the way back even before, uh, was it Henry Licklider or I'm not sure his first name, but talking about cybernetics and the merger of technology and human consciousness back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And so this whole okay. book shows DARPA's involvement, um, you know, DOD's involvement in right. the, yeah. basically the building of the internet. Yeah. And so now we're, we're yeah. kind of at the dawning of um, Web3 where a lot of people believe that it's, you know, Web 2 was more of like social media. It's read and write, but there it was closed. There's a lot of centralized spots. And the metaverses that are coming out now, there are a lot of people that are saying the old model, like what Facebook is trying to do and still go into these territories and be centralized, it's it's just not going to work. And there's there's something about this increased pressure at the same time, like these increased uh, restrictions that people are experiencing and rapid change, right. at the same time as people coming to have new ideas to wrap around what's happening happening in the world, and it's driving innovation. It is kind of interesting. It almost makes me feel like if you want to get humanity to um, not just be more in, inventive and ingenious in terms of technology and externalities, but mm -hmm. also with um, mm -hmm. using consciousness and the like yeah. actual ascension. One way to right. potentially do that is to ramp up some of the pressure and some of the stress. Um, of Absolutely. What's happening. I mean, people often uh, forget humanity has not had a predator other than ourselves for around 12,000 years, but mm, we do now. True. We, we have a predator. It's called AI and and the the governments that are utilizing this force. And uh, right now it, it's kind of just sort of everywhere, right? And it, it's not physical. Mm -hmm. But soon it will be because what 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 is happening is we're starting to see companies like Samsung with their neon and and others creating replacement humans that look just like you and just like like I, and you can't tell the difference between a, an organic human and a, and a being created in these, uh, on the screens, there's CGI in these labs that have an existence only behind the glass right now. But the engineers that are working on it know that those beings will be able to cross over the glass. And, and that's when we've got real problems. And, mm -hmm. and that's what we have to understand as a potential, not end game, but what is unfolding right before us right now. I mean, we, we, we're just kind of bewildered, many people are, about the, the state of the technology. You know, we chuckle when the AI, you know, gives us a message or completes a sentence or whatever, but we don't realize where we're just about one or two, three steps away from if we're not careful. 
Yeah, and the innovation is speeding up as well. Like um, mm -hmm. the next five years of innovation may mirror the past 10 or 15 or more. And there's this thing right. that kind of speaks to speaks to what you're talking about as far as when the military uh, or it, maybe it was NASA also speaking about creating this mirror world um, mm -hmm. and this digital right. simulation. Have you heard of right. there's this thing called the sentient world simulation and it's not fully mm. operational yet. Um, but basically the, the whole point is to be like the central node or the central hub because there, I mean, in, in truth, there really isn't a, a thing called the cloud. It's just another computer. And this right. would be a centralized spot for all the sensors that communicate with the cloud to eventually get fast enough that in real time it can know what entire groups of people are doing and potentially predict where they may go, where they may amass, whether there might be a protest mm -hmm. or something like that. And this is all right. simulated in that respect. And I've been seeing this other thing, you know, I, I was curious, and I won't get into it, but I was curious about the, the use of PCR tests um, and the, the, the wide, wide use of PCR tests and also the sequencing of genomes. There's a BG group out of China that um, Bill Gates mm -hmm. moved the headquarters to um, Washington. And basically their dream is to sequence every the genome of every living thing on planet Earth and to have it sequenced so it can run with things like the sentient world simulation, which Microsoft is a backer of. So there's very interesting mm -hmm. things that kind of like very much so back up what you were seeing happening back in 2002. Yeah. So I, I right. applaud you for putting the word out. Um, it's I can't say it's unfortunate that we haven't you know started to wake up until just recently because I, I think maybe there is a perfection in in what's happening right now. And it maybe it had to get to this point to where we see the change happening so rapidly that it, it starts yeah. waking us up to, well, we got to think of some options. Do I really want to go full cyborg? You know, the, the internet of bodies, ingestibles, implantables, wearables, tracing and tracking everything I do, geofencing around my house. A lot of, I mean, whether you could say this was planned or not, but a lot of the natural disasters that have happened in California and Australia, a lot of the protests that have happened, fires that have destroyed entire um, areas, the smart grid is building back in its place. And I saw the mm -hmm. you know sustainable development goals uh, agenda 21 back in the day saying we need to get everybody moving into these smart cities. I didn't even know what a smart city was. I just thought it was like a mega city. I didn't know the technological. Um, uh, detail inside that because if you look at China I think there's uh, roughly now 130 smart cities and it's like you're walking inside of a device Alibaba is is has yeah. all the traffic right. moving around so like we're already yeah. here most people I, I just yeah. don't think have woken up to it so what keeps right. you hopeful in the face of of this moving so quickly well I uh... Uh, the simple, honest answer is the book of Revelation, because the, to me, the, the only way to kind of contextualize what's going on right now is to look at it in terms of the prophecy of the fulfillment of the mark of the beast and the image of the beast and uh, the, the right response to this in, intrusion into, into our world. I mean, the book of Revelation, in some people's estimation, is just, a, you know, the, the last book of the Bible, and it, it doesn't really relate to our times, but it, it's very archetypal in its symbolism. It, and I believe that the scenarios that are described in it, where you have a, a, a dragon that comes out of the sky that engenders a, a, a a prophet, a, a dark prophet who gets everybody to, to take the mark of the beast, which is some kind of technology perhaps put in our hand or our forehead, VR, hello, mm. with, the, with the gloves and the, haptic the glasses suits, yeah. and yeah, and haptic suits. And this is where you're going to meet the Antichrist. And because the Antichrist isn't going to show up in some kind of organic body, it's going to be an experience that billions of people can have simultaneously mm -hmm. and be controlled by. And the only way you get control or get into access to it is through the mark of the beast, which is the only way you can buy, sell, or trade. And that's happening in our world right now. But there's a counter to this, this, this intrusion, and that is a group of righteous souls described as 144,000 in number in the book of Revelation rise up. They refuse to take the mark of the beast. They refuse to engage this technology. 
and they begin to develop what is referred to as the seal of God. And this protects them from the mark of the beast, and it also assures that their, their continued existence in, in the afterlife. And the good news in the book of Revelation is that the light wins. The, an, an angel comes out of the sky with a key to abyss and chucks this Antichrist in, in, a, in an abyss for a thousand years. And this is what I think we need to do with AI, is chuck it in a, in a, in a lockbox for a thousand years and then come back uh, later and see if we actually need it. Spend that thousand years developing ourselves spiritually, work on our organic capabilities, and then see if we need AI. I guarantee we won't. Hmm. There are some uh, there are some qualities that you mentioned in this in this video um, that we need to cultivate during this time as well. Three of them being um, humility, compassion, patience, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. it's quite interesting that what seems like what is um, extraordinarily new in terms of all this technology and the the conundrums that we face with the the rise of this technology that the solutions could be so simple and that the solutions are so timeless that you know humility mm -hmm. compassion patience these are things that there probably was never a time where they they were not integral to family tribe um you know community in general and also the way we treat ourselves and so right. like with that what are you know what are some things that you believe um we could before we hop into because i really want to get into these articles that you sent as well but like what are some things mm -hmm. that people if they're not even really understanding the the technology side of the writing on the wall what what could we engage in because the you know this this specific podcast goes out to a certain amount of people, but this is something that I talk about consistently. I'll actually be doing, I think, in March, a transformational event at Gaia, speaking on some of these some of these topics. Um, what are some of the things that we individually don't need somebody else, or don't need the you know the grace of some company or some kind of affluence to begin working on now? Well, one begin to connect with. The, the your higher future self. Uh, all of us ha are in a state of evolution, and we're, we're utilizing the technology as a way to accelerate that evolution. In the history of technology, when you when you get into how did we start utilizing technology? I mean, when eyeglasses were invented, they were rejected at first because the the, the church said if God wanted you to see, He would have given you a decent set of eyes. Who are you to challenge God's authority? by augmenting your body with eyeglasses. But now everybody uses eyeglasses. So there's, there are technologies that, and augmentation that, that work for us. But the key thing is, is that the aim of both our spiritual lives and our technological lives ultimately is a word that you used earlier, which is one of my, my favorite words. It's the word perfection. We're all seeking to, to be more perfect. This is what the Silicon Valley engineers are working on. It's like, hey, this body's too fragile to go live in space. We, we've got to augment it. We've got a packet full of technology so we can shoot it off to Mars or some other dead planet where we're gonna, that we're going to be terraforming, right? Um, so the, the goal is, is perfection with the technology, but organically, we're also seeking perfection. And perfection isn't something you get from a a Beverly Hills plastic surgeon, let's say, you know, you can't just augment, 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 and then call yourself perfect because perfect is a, it's a spiritual quality. It means to be more whole, it means to be more holy, more complete. And so what we can, all of us can do now on a day-to-day -day basis is to think, well, if, if, if wholeness is the goal, how close am I to being a whole and holy being? And, and that is, that's individually specific. And what I ask people is, to think about is that wholeness is symbolized by a circle, and a circle is 360 degrees. So on a scale of 0 to 360, what I'm really asking is, 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 is where are you at? How, how whole and complete are you? How close to 360 are you? And if you're at, say, today, 300, then begin to think about what you'll be doing when you're at, say, 310 or 320. You'll be doing new and different things mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally when you're at that higher frequency, if you will, if you will, at 320. So think about what those things are. 
start doing them now and that will uh, automatically then begin to change your frequency and put you at that higher level where all of a sudden there's new ideas and inspirations you can't even think of right now that will come into your into your consciousness and this is what you were saying a moment ago about the acceleration of consciousness and people getting new ideas and inspirations it's because we're we're literally raising our frequency and i know that sounds new agey but it's it's a good way to talk about this and that's that is what all of us have to do right now on a daily basis is raise our frequency and if we do that this is how we're going to be able to to transcend uh the the darkness that that is unfolding in our world right now yeah, I agree. And and I also agree that, you know, there unfortunately when talking about these things, I feel it's only a matter of time before even the the you know, the techies are using terms that by a, a few years ago standards would be new age. And, you know, mm-hmm. I really like the idea of connecting with our future self. It's something that, you know, like um we there's something in us that we we know how to connect with that thing that that is speaking to us and telling us like no no no, this is the right path and that that other Mm -hmm. thing you're doing as much as you think it's gonna bring you some joy it's it's not uh in the long run so connecting with you know what is maybe not the perfected me but the you know 50 yards down the field me Right. look like how do how does that me behave how does that me handle stress right. and i've also had right. this um interesting vision that has come to me over the years that there will be a point in time and i i haven't pinpointed it but i just imagine it somewhere between 2020 and 2030 2035 where the ability to handle stress you know, while connecting with your center is going to be increasingly more important as the days go by, as the years go by, especially imagine, you know, I have, I have three kids and when the house gets noisy, if something happens to my head, it's very difficult to even like just think straight and do something simple. Now imagine not just everyone in your house, but everyone that you can see in the perceivable world around you is yeah. losing their minds, scared, panicked, and what what do people do in panic? And I've had that mm-hmm. vision come to me many times, and the only thing I could connect to was begin working on it now, begin working mm-hmm. on how to connect with your center in the face of whatever stress that you have now as a discipline and a, as a practice to further refine the quality of who you are because you will be needed. Right in you know right. in this world to come you will be needed so i really Absolutely. i really i i appreciate the way that you um you mentioned that connect it's not something we need outside of us or it's not something that we have to go and check with another source to make sure we're on the right track you really have to right. uh, you're pointing people back within and saying listen the the answers are in there yeah. and, and they're muddied by a yeah. lot of noise but they are in there Yeah, I always like to share a really uh, simple anecdote. Um, Back around 2007, I put out a presentation called The Light Body Effect. And in this, I I was talking about the robe of light and how we activate the light body and and so forth. And I I, uh, used to mail out DVDs back then, so I'd go to the post office and I had a, a gentleman that worked there. I got to know just, you know, on a friendly basis, banter at the post office. His name was Fred. And so I come walking in after several years of bantering with them with the light body effect. And he goes, is that a diet? And I said, no, but but that's a really good idea, Fred. I should uh, do a light body diet. How can you eat to activate your your light body and connect with your, your higher self and so forth? But it was then that he told me that he was actually on the weekends, he was a Pentecostal minister. Hmm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, Pentecostals, they have a a reputation. I said that, I said, Fred, you guys are supposed to be like real acid Christians. Like you're way out there hardcore. And he said, yeah, we pretty much are. And and I said, well, when you're talking about um, like the transfiguration of Jesus, when he morphs from his earthly flesh into his celestial flesh, his his light body, what's your sermon? And he said, oh, well, I give this... uh, this anecdote attributed to, to Michelangelo, where he's working with one of his apprentices, and the apprentice says, Master, 
um, how are you going to sculpt that a horse out of that block of marble? And Michelangelo is said to have replied, I'm going to look at this block of marble and I'm going to remove everything that doesn't have to do with a horse. Hmm. And I, I got it. Okay, that how, how do we connect with our more whole, our more holy, more perfect self, our future self? We look at our life and say, is this helping me to become more whole, holy, and complete? If not, then maybe we want to start leaving it behind and doing and, and spending our time and attention on things that do uh, allow us to do that. But the key point, as you mentioned, is it, it's already within. The, the light body isn't something we go get, and that's not my teaching. That's the that's Tibetan Buddhism. It's it's already within you, and it's covered over by false perceptions and and negative thinking and just the general malaise that we live in. Is it's all gets us gunked up. I mean, these stories of like a black goo within us start to really ring true. And what we have to do is find a way to to remove that goo and reveal the light from within. And that that is the seal of God. That is the seal of the 144,000. And so that's kind of where my, my personal act of interest is right now and is, okay, um, you're telling me this, this assault is, is happening. It's unfolding. It's war. It, it, it's not a it's not anything but a war. There is a light side and there's a dark side. The dark side wants to, they want my body. They want your body. They want everybody's body. They want control of it. And so that means you're going to let them in. You're going to let them break the skin barrier, which I advise against doing unless it's a life and death scenario. Um, or you're going to say, no, the, the skin is mine. And everything in, in the side, the skin is mine. And, and you stay out. And I'm going to develop what is within, and I'm going to allow that aspect of myself to to emerge. And that is the seal that will protect me from the 5G. It'll protect me from the, the onslaught of subliminal programming. It'll protect me from any of the frequency weapons that they're using. It, it'll protect me from everything because I'm I'm now activating my my latent spiritual capabilities. That's where we're at right now. Mm. Uh, so there's something that you mentioned about the the light body, and I mm -hmm. I've thought even just recently. So I have um, deeper dives that are behind the paywall. I do like Monday I do news, and then I'll I'll put a deeper dive behind the paywall. And in this one, I was showing um, basically EMFs and you know 5G and 4G effects on water and also on DNA. Mm -hmm. But then showing that there's this mm -hmm. guy Dolph Zantinga that um, brings coherence back to water. And he, he shows that this, there, there are several ways to do it. Technology has a way of doing it, but by doing it internally, by creating coherence mm -hmm. within the body internally, um, not only does it take, uh, because the sun gives off massive radiation, but the difference between that and your router mm -hmm. is the router is imba imbalanced and the sun right. gives balanced radiation. And, um, so uh, spoke about Shaga and the melanin in Shaga allowing for more light absorption from outside of you. So I was thinking of the light diet when you said that, and also water is a prism. It, it you know it works with right. light and also w works through our myofascial system if the myofascial system is healthy. But then I came across mm -hmm. this thing. It's research at the University of Kassel in Germany showed that it's possible to produce visible light from the chest area under certain conditions. Mm -hmm. And that's the first of the certain conditions is a heart-centered meditation right. practice. So again, it's something right. that you cultivate. It's not something you have to buy at a store. Right. So yeah, exactly. I, I would love for you to, go ahead, yeah, go ahead, and, go ahead and comment on that. Yeah, so that, that tasted to the core of what I call the art and science of living ascension because the ancients practiced uh, an open heart and open eye meditation on images. They, they believed that the avatars, probably through what we now call quantum entanglement, could transmit their, their codes, frequencies, vibrations through images. And so, for example, in, in, in Christianity, you have icon makers that made icons of, of Jesus morphing into light in the transfiguration when, when he, uh, his his body, his his face and his body became like lightning or plasma. He he phased into a plasma state of being and then back into a, a, a human flesh and blood body. Well, the icon makers taught that icons of Jesus doing that were actually sacred mirrors. 
that just simply by connecting with those, especially eye to eye and heart to heart, that as an avatar, Jesus could transmit the codes of that light body experience to you through the image. And the key thing is I've matched this up with, with modern neuroscience that talks about the mirror neurons in our frontal cortex that essentially say that whatever we see, we become. Mm. So if we're looking at an image of Jesus birthing, or morphing into light, bursting into light, a part of our, our DNA is firing, the, the mirror neurons in our frontal cortex are firing as if that is happening to us. But we've all got this editor that says, hey, chill out, William, you, know, you got to talk with Ben this afternoon. Don't go full light body looking <laughs> at this image on your desktop, right? But, but that is one way that we train the brain and train the body of what it will be like when we have this seal of light around us, when we are living in our future selves. And it's one simple tool, but very powerful tool that everyone that's listening can put in their toolkit. Everyone can find a, a beautiful, inspiring image online um, of Jesus bur bursting into light, or it could, be, uh, it could be Mother Mary, it could be Padmasambhava, the Tibetan guru, it could be an image of Osiris, it could be any of these that that inspire you, and the key thing is, is that you're you're simply l allowing it to function for uh, for its stated purpose, which is it was a portal, it was a gateway, it was a means of you to to connect with not only your higher self but also an avatar being that loves you unconditionally and wants to see you activate the, the best part of yourself. Yeah, yeah, and it is is very interesting nowadays looking upon this art. I don't believe that we look upon it as for as long of a time as we would have before the internet, before TV, before lifestyles started getting so rapid, I would imagine mm -hmm. that you go back a few hundred years, you would sit there staring at this artwork for quite some time. And nowadays, probably we might, we might look at it, take a look at all the elements on it, maybe not get through the entire thing if it's too intricate and then move on. So I think that's right. a really good... That's right. a really good point. You, the two articles yeah. that you just recently sent me, I uh, want to touch base on mm -hmm. because you mentioned the anointing oil. And we've talked about the anointing oil here before. And I, I was really glad to see at least the um, the mention of um, some of the ingredients in there. So you mentioned uh, olive oil. You also mentioned mm -hmm. um, cannabosum as either being uh, sweet cane or cannabis. There's this author, Chris Bennett, and he's written mm -hmm. several books. You know him? I don't know, but I, I remember starting to read his book in the 90s. Awesome, awesome material. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he he was one of the ones that was really just tracing archaeological finds with cannabis and stuff like that, but he really got... Um, interested, and I think there's even a YouTube video called Cannabosum on uh, yeah. on the internet where he just goes straight for retracing what that may have been. He absolutely believes it was um, cannabis. Goes back to Sula Bennett and you know earlier um, etymologists and people like that. But with that being mm -hmm. said, I'd really love to dive into these articles and really understand. You mentioned the anointing oil and how it would bring about joy, but this isn't the, you know, probably the average mundane type of joy that we may get from, you know, whatever, seeing a cute meme on, on social media or something like that. I, right. I would like you to break this down for right. us because I think this is really important for us to understand. Oh, yeah, thank you. I, um, I'm very interested in the, the mystical aspects of, of Christianity. So when we talk about the oil of joy, uh, as I do in the article, it's relative to uh, James, the brother of Jesus, who healed with an anointing oil called the oil of joy. And traditional Christianity says, yeah, this is like olive oil. And, you know, they hide that there, if there was a, a cannabis component and they, they make a point. Yeah, it gives you a shiny face. And, you know, it's like, yeah, it happens if you rub olive oil on your face, you're going to have a shiny face. And I'm like, oh, man, don't you guys get? What, where, what this is, you don't know what this oil is, do you? Mm -hmm. Because you don't know that it existed before the time of Christianity, that it was well known among the Sumerians, it was known among the Egyptians, that there's, there's, there are oils that can transmute the body into light, that can create a non-molecular light body. And, and this is what James, the brother of Jesus, was dealing with. I mean, it drives me crazy in, in traditional Christianity where they, they treat James or, or Jesus and their family as these kind of 
I don't know, just sort of hillbillies from Nazareth kind of a thing. And they really mm -hmm. don't know much about what's going on. But the fact of the matter is, is that they were deep esoteric research, high researchers, highly trained metaphysicians. They were miraphors. They knew the secret of oil. They knew what the anointing oils could do. And they knew, they knew that there were plants that can activate our, our psycho-spiritual capabilities and even plants that can dissolve the body into life. And that's the, been the focus of, of my research for, for a while. Um, James uh, is, I, is, is the subject of this article. He's, he's called the Rainmaker. And the reason why is because he assembles a kit of tools that was going to be used by his brother, Jesus. And they call this, this kit the, the Edomatia throne. Of, of the second coming or the throne of Christ. It, it, it had a pre-existence before the time of Jesus, and James went and assembled it. And it's, it's essentially the, the Ark of the Covenant with the, uh, with the rod of Aaron, whose name means enlightenment. It's a flask of manna, which is psychoactive, and it's a cruise of anointing oil. And once all of this kit is assembled, it forms the throne of Christ. And so these brothers are like utilizing these, these ancient esoteric arts, making anointing oils, understanding the, the mystic physiology of the body, how it can be transmuted into light, and, and actively using them. And what we have left over in, uh, in the New Testament anyway is sort of a super watered down version of, yeah, James anointed with oil, but there's no direct references to the, the, the actual experience of, of what it brought about, which is the, the transformation of the human body into its light body form. And that's joy, by the way, to answer your question. That, that is what joy means in this context. It's not, yeah, I just got had an ice cream. I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in a state of joy. It means, no, I'm in a state of pure universal bliss because now I am... Uh, I have completed my earthly evolution. I am a, 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 a being of a pure light and pure intelligence. That's joy. I, I noticed as I was going through this article, and for those listening, I posted it in the chat, um, the article that we were just speaking about, that there was a room, the Holy of the Holies, and I believe it was the King of Solomon. And Solomon is Temple. that, was that? In I'm Solomon's sorry, Temple, yes. Yes, King Solomon's Temple. And it was it was a cube mm -hmm. room, uh, as quite interesting, mm -hmm. and I think the yeah. walls were gold. And this yeah. is where they would anoint themselves. They had to do it away from, uh, I think the word was the unclean. Is that correct? Right. Because as you, as you get into this process of utilizing these oils, you're talking about dissolving the body into light, which means you're you're no longer an organic human being. You are now at a, at a next higher spiritual level. And this is why they would then be separated from the rest of the people, the, the, the you know, people that are, that are in mat or organic flesh and blood bodies. Mm. Did you, I mean, have you been curious at all about like, so the, the quality of let's say a cube being inside of a cube and then with gold walls, the quality of gold, the way that it, it, it uh, vibrates, um, mm -hmm. that, that in and of itself must be a, a super experience. And then wh what you were you know, explaining here, and I, I wanna make sure that the audience also knows that because before when we had Chris Bennett on the show, we focused highly on cannabis. So there was this emphasis on there being a cannabis-like elevated state attached to a lot of what's being talked about in the Bible. But I would like to right. also you know, at least mention that Maybe that had an element to it, but there's also a lot more work than just going inside a gold cube and potentially getting high. And, and when you said the flask of manna, that reminds me of Jerry yeah. Brown's uh, work. Uh, if you're familiar with Jerry Brown, he also looks at a lot of ancient um, uh, Christian artwork and takes a look at all the um, mushroom symbolism in there. And mm -hmm. we know that this was these plants were well known in these days. They probably knew a lot more about plants than the average person today does. Mm -hmm. Um definitely. But, yeah, but I would like do you have any thoughts around what the how should I say it? The 
peripheral practices were. So there's there's this oil, but what were some of the peripheral practices? Because yeah. we're talking about not just the Essenes, but also the Essenes here, correct? Right. And so um, before you enter into that that most holy place, you're gonna you're gonna cross over a veil that separated the most holy place from the holy place of the temple. And the important thing is is that everything that's beyond that veil is most holy. And, and what that means is is that the objects and the things that the, the gold walls, the Ark of the Covenant, the the manna, everything that is in that most holy room can transmit holiness. That's what most holy means. Mm -hmm. And so you have a, a mortal human, a high priest, let's say, or even a, a high priestess, who's on this side of the veil. And before they cross over the veil, they put on a, a, a getup. They put on the, 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 the crown of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sandals of peace that let their faith be their shield. And now they're ready to cross over the veil, which is crossing over from matter into the immaterial world, and they then they have this experience. And I, I think the, uh, the 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 role of cannabis in the holy of Hol or the most holy place was they would have sensors burning cannabis that would produce a cloud because ultimately what's going to happen is you're going to have an experience in that room with a luminous humanoid being who has rainbow colored light emanating from its body that mm -hmm. manifests in the cloud between the, the cherubims of the Ark of the Covenant. And so it's, it's what you're talking about is a super fast moving, super high frequency being manifesting in this golden cube shaped room on the Ark of the Covenant. And the high priest is the one who's got the crown, the breastplate and the belt of truth, and he's good to go. Now, the question is, is that an actual breastplate and belt and sandals and crown that he's wearing? Mm -hmm. and I don't think it is. I think it's symbolic. I think it's symbolic of opening the crown of wisdom, opening your heart, speaking truth, walking in peace. These are all, all psycho attributes or apps within us that, that we can all activate. And this is what the high priest was able to do. So he's already an evolved being and is now going through this veil crossing over from matter to the immaterial world and having this experience and then being able to cross back over the veil and phase back into physicality. Now, what my research shows is that there's an oil that can help you do that. It's called the oil of joy. And the ancients knew about this. They knew about this oil that could dissolve the body. Then you can have this experience and then phase back into your physical body if you choose to do so. And that's really at the core of ultimately what I'm, I, I have been seeking for 20 years. Wow. So this um, oil of joy, is it the same thing as the anointing oil or is that different? Well, there's different anointing oils that are mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you have James anointing people and healing. You have the anointing oil that was used by the, the women of Galilee, the Miraphors that were present at the uh, crucifixion of Jesus. You have the anointing oil, and this is what started me on this whole quest, Ben, was uh, the Essene story of Enoch's ascension, where the uh, Archangel Michael comes and, and takes Enoch and takes him up to the third heaven, which is where Eden was supposed to be located, and anointed Enoch with an oil that dissolved his body into light so that now his body was exactly the same as the angels. Wow. Now, there are some researchers that have followed this path and they go, yeah, that's that shiny oil, like olive oil. The angels wore olive oil. That's why they're called the shining ones. And I'm like, hmm. no, that's not why they're called the shining ones. They're called the shining ones because they're literally luminous beings. It's not because they have shiny skin because of olive oil all over their body. Read what Enoch said that when he was anointed with this oil, his body was now the same as the angels. And the angels are described as having bodies composed of rainbows. They are in their perfect rainbow light body as the Tibetans describe it. And I, I match those two states of being and saying that the, what they're saying is that there is an oil that can transmute the body into uh, the rainbow light body. And this is what the story of Enoch is about. And that is one of the anointing oils.
And so think about the power of, of that oil. What kind of an oil can, can dissolve the body into light? And it, is it produced by plants on earth or are, are there plants somewhere else um, in some other dimension that we've got to bring those plants over, that oil over from? These are some of the questions that uh, preoccupy my research and still working on it, but uh, that's where all this is leading me. Yeah, it's it's super interesting. And, you know, to, to leave a cliffhanger unless um, – You've gotten farther on at the end of this article, you say, where is the oil now? Will it return in our time as prophesized uh, or as prophesied? Um, what, how was it prophesied that it might return in this time? When the Ark of the Covenant disappeared around 700 BC and was lost, it was ultimately returned in, in story form. And when it was returned, it was missing key pieces. Mm. Today, when we think of the Ark of the Covenant, we think of a golden box, you know, Indiana Jones, you know, we're off to right. get the Ark of the Covenant. It's this golden box. That's not the Ark of the Covenant. That's part of the Ark of the Covenant. The rest of the Ark of the Covenant is the rod of Aaron, the cruise of manna, the anointing oil, a robe of light, and several other pieces that that all get assembled okay and when the the patriarchy took over in jerusalem they they, they were like this is the, the box is the ark of the covenant and that's it but there were mystic oriented jews mostly essenes some buddhists that knew and remembered the original real complete ark of the covenant and they excuse me long prophecy that when the messiah appears he will recover that Ark of the Covenant and assembled it. But in this case, it was actually his brother James who assembled it. And the prophecy is, is that in order for the second coming to occur, this same complete Ark of the Covenant, including the anointing oil and the flask of manna must be recovered. Hmm. And so that's where we're at right now is, is saying, well, okay, some believe we're in a time of prophecy there certainly are people uh, in, in high political office looking for the Ark of the Covenant. They're seeking to fulfill this prophecy. We're all in the midst of all this now. And so what are, what are the ultimate pieces that need to come together? And, and, and what is the role of, of each of us? And what I ultimately try to do is, uh, one, internalize that to, to show that, you know, if you're going to approach the Ark of the Covenant, you want to you want to have the complete outfit of the, the high priest, the crown of righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, sandals of peace. So first place to start for all of us is to begin to embody these qualities of higher consciousness, righteousness, open heartedness, speaking truth, walking in peace. And then to recognize that it, our body is actually the technology that we're trying to duplicate out here. And what we need to do is learn how to activate what we already have and then we'll realize we won't need what NASA, what the military, what everybody else is trying to, to force upon us right now. Mm -hmm. Because it does feel like that's that's the false. The, using the same exact language, but diverting it into a box, really. Something that, that is yeah. not meant for expansion. Um, what Mark Zuckerberg, what Apple, what all the, everybody that's involved in... Uh, creating the, the the great reset they are they are mocking and mimicking organic ascension they are they are saying you know god doesn't exist your soul doesn't exist you don't matter give up climb into our black box and that'll be your ascension bubba that that that's basically where they're coming from mm. and so in that same respect the um the the antichrist would have to appear to quite some numbers of people as yeah. being a savior, as truly being a right. savior. Probably, right. you know, what's, what, you know, we'd probably laugh at thinking about this, but probably coming at us as an influencer, somebody that millions and Trent millions of people Scott. love and they, they respect, you know, and yeah. it, it's hard to imagine, but it, you know, it won't, come to us as some demon, you know, twisting its mustache, you know, or, or George Burns twiddling its fingers. It's, it's probably going to appear right. 
almost as, and you would remember this, I've been in the music industry for quite some time. And when digital really started outperform, not outperforming, um, outperforming economically the analog, a lot of people were saying mm -hmm. it's exactly the same. It, it you can't tell the difference, and the the audio files could. They're like, no, you can absolutely tell right. the difference. There's a big difference, and that seems to be where right. we're going. I, I want to mention this mainly just because I haven't said it out loud before. But if you've noticed that digital can get you an almost exact replica, but you know, to a trained eye, you can see, okay, this isn't real. This isn't reality. So a lot of what I believe. Disney has done, and there's other economic reasons for this, but Disney, Pixar, um, all these very well-crafted animations that look almost real, like Frozen and Moana mm -hmm. and things along those lines. If you get reality, if you can't make the digital completely um, mimic reality, then you get what people take as reality, like TV and things like that, and you start bending it towards what they've always right. known. So we've always known, like, if you wanted to make a good movie, you had to make it look really, really real. And nowadays, if you watch a lot of films, you can see straight through, especially with 4K TVs, you can see straight through the effects. But I think we're just getting numb to it. And we're like, oh, well, that's that's a movie, though. You know, I can see the effects. Yeah, but that's right. a movie. And I kind of feel like that's also softening us up for entering these these many metaverses, if we will. And taking that yeah. as reality, because you replace what you're it seeing is. with something digital, you replace what you're hearing, and then with a haptic suit, you can feel it. And then on top mm -hmm. of that, I really believe that the way that a lot of psychedelic IPOs are going, taking these, you know, um, plant medicines that have a long held indigenous heritage and a cultural container around it, getting all that indigenous wisdom and empirical wisdom out of there and then turning it into a business and now you can have these patches ketamine and mdma infused po potentially in the future so you can be in an immersive experience and it's also changing your your hormonal and neurotransmitter cascades i, I like i see that's going to be for so many people real enough for them to just say yes to the matrix even though they've seen the matrix mm -hmm. and that might have even been one of their favorite movies real enough uh, you know unless mm -hmm. there is there there is another force that seems to rise up and and at least makes it known like listen like it, it doesn't mean you can't touch technology i think it's beautiful that we're using technology to speak with one another right now but i always talk about also like what's the cost you know, since 2020, how many 5G towers have gone up? And that's not even technically fully operational yet. And then right. I've, I've spoken about before, as I was talking with you earlier, the Internet of underwater things. There's nothing sacred mm -hmm. anymore. In our oceans, it's taken it's the, the airwaves all the way down to our cellular biology and our DNA. So, yeah. like, I, I, I'm saying all this to really stress the importance of what you're mentioning that like we we have this incredible instrument right and we've barely scratched the surface on what it is and we're already right. you know i i'm saying we it's a blanket statement but a lot of people are already ready to just like well i, I don't want to see this thing anymore like the the movie ready player one the the female had this big birthmark on her face, but she was totally cool in the metaverse, right? In you know, in the virtual reality, had the great haircut, could change avatars, whatever. I think that's going to be really, really flashy, but I don't think it's going to capture yeah. everyone's attention. So maybe that's the hundred and forty-four thousand yeah. that you're talking about. It, it could be, and and um, we're we're right at that point where people have to really understand this choice, and as spiritual people. We have to be able to communicate to people, everybody say, look, when you, when you talk about the military, when you talk about Elon Musk, they, they believe that, that you just live in a movie, that all this is just a movie and, and you don't even exist. You have, in fact, you have no existence outside of, of this reality. So just give up, okay? Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's their message. Get into the black box and, and have a good time. Be beautiful, perfect, and, and, and everything's gonna be Great, it'll be so much better than this. But as spiritual people, we have to accept that challenge and recognize, okay, now is the time where we have to be able to provide experiences of 
contact with source reality, the reality out of this one, whether it's the, the pure land of Buddhism or the new Jerusalem of Christianity or any of the higher worlds spoken of in all of the world's religious and spiritual traditions, we have to give people a visceral encounter with that real world. And that is, I think, the antidote to artificial intelligence. I've always said the antidote is our raising our angelic in intelligence is the antidote to artificial intelligence. And that's what I'm talking about here. We've got to begin to plug into what is the halo around the angels and, and how do they get that halo? And how can I get that? How can I have that experience of this divine light of, of a light beyond light. That is the key right now. And, and fortunately, um, we do have a lot of psychoactive substance being descheduled right now. They're being totally abused by these corporations, completely agree with that. Mm -hmm. But we can also use that same tool as a gateway or a pathway towards bringing in that, that higher light that will transform our, our lives. And, and that is the, the promise of, of what is within each of us. I love that. I love that you mentioned that. Um, there is something about these these plant medicines, and it's not for everybody. And I think those who aren't called to it, they're just not going to use it. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, being somebody who you know, I went down to the Amazon. I think it was two thousand seven. It was two thousand eight or two thousand seven for the first time, and I was just blown away. Of course, I was <laughs> I was a kid in the '90s, so by the age of fourteen, I had tried mushrooms and psilocybin mm -hmm. mushrooms and what's beautiful about that was i i was too young and and you know i'll say it i was too young and dumb to really understand the the nuance of the difference but a lot of my mm -hmm. friends were getting into opiates a lot of my friends were mm -hmm. getting into just hard synthetic drugs and once i had done mm -hmm. mushrooms that not only mm -hmm. like i i tried it a few times and it didn't work but it also, I could tell that what did work about it was just doing this to my consciousness. And I, I could yeah. tell that the, you know, these plants did this and it made me interested in art and it made me want to listen to music and it, it had me hearing different things inside the music. Fast forward right. 10 years or so, I'm down in the Amazon and I finally have a shamanic cultural container, something that's been there for, you know, some say up to 10,000 years in the Amazon, some say only a couple thousand, right. but even that, you know, what do we have today right. that's that's been around in the same tradition for even a couple thousand years? And that was the right. first time that I realized that makes so much of the difference is the, the set and setting and also something that is intact with a lineage intact with ancestors and every single mm -hmm. ceremony I've been to, whether it been peyote, iboga, ayahuasca, I can go on and on, each and every one of them acknowledged ancestors and acknowledged those light beings who have walked before us. And they had yeah. specific words and music and ways of evoking some of these, um, yeah. some of these spirits. And I thought that, I think that's yeah. very beautiful that you mentioned that even though yes there are ipos and i've i've seen and spoken with a few and those that are getting involved with it in mass the mostly have no clue nor a care about the 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 history of these plants it's really like it it really comes down to the almighty dollar but these these beings these plants uh, were always seen as teachers and they weren't even seen yes. as like gods or things that like we we could scarcely understand no you commune with them they were a sacrament and it it was also something that you're not giving all of the thanks to the thing itself it's the experience and understanding that it's like this right. bridge between you and the experience thank you for allowing me the experience um, but the right. experience is this transcendent, uh, you know, or the ascension process, even if just momentarily to gather a glimpse. Right. And I think there are at least enough yeah. people that have gathered glimpses that there is so much more beyond what we're experiencing now. And the last thing I want to say that ties into some amazing work that you've been doing for a long time on ancient aliens is nowadays the conversation seems to be dovetailing. I think it was, um, I have this book by Ralph Blumenthal that was um, mm -hmm. uh, John Mack, really getting into the work of John right. Mack, when even he was talking about right. a lot of this encounter experience 
and these pan-dimensional entities on DMT or ayahuasca is starting to dovetail so neatly with what were once called, you know, aliens or um, other, you know, um, not just pan-dimensional but off-planet beings. What are your thoughts right. on these plants? destabilizing our default uh, default mode network so we have a sense for other beings that are that are around us we're just not seeing them in default mode yeah i mean we've th th they've always been here they they pred predate humanity in many instances and mm. so we they are of course our our teachers and this this is the answer right now especially because um and i wanted to mention this earlier that uh, it was actually James Lovelock who came up with the Gaia hypothesis that, yeah. that Earth is a conscious entity. He he thinks AI was sent by Gaia. Mm -hmm. He thinks AI was sent by Gaia. And he's held to that for about 10 years now. He's about 100 years old. And he's proposed that, and he still maintains that. And mm -hmm. But enfolded with that, within that seems to me is that, okay, if Gaia has the, that is a, a solution, <laughs> for challenging humanity, then Gaia also is providing other means, more positive means, and 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 that's what these sacred plants are. They there are teachers, and there as we said a moment ago, there are our, our pathway towards healing not only ourselves but also healing healing Gaia, and mm. that that's why I think we're seeing this happening right now. I mean, I, I I'm a child of the '60s, and the, the Beatles brought yoga and meditation to the West. Mm -hmm. And now you've got hundreds of millions of people around the world that are practicing yoga. They're 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 connecting with their their light body self, whether they realize it or not. Now we need hundreds of millions and billions of people enjoying the sacred plants and and with the, the intention that they're communing with Gaia and where they're healing our, themselves and healing our world. That's when everything shifts. Wow. That's really interesting you, that you mentioned that. Uh, I did not know that about James Lovelock. Um, I'd heard that before, and I'm not opposed to opening my mind to seeing that a lot of what I've seen before as a challenge. Like I, I am not opposed to technology put my foot down because I also sense that there are there are a technologies like I'm looking at. But there are also, I mean, mm -hmm. all the way to a hammer was a technology to get us to this point. I can right. see Absolutely. that there is some underlying, you know, story that seems to be evolving. But it is interesting that you mention AI, which predominantly, at least um, before China was like super in the race, was coming out of Silicon Valley. And Silicon mm -hmm. Valley is basically the you know the old boneyards of um, the psychedelic hippie movement as well, and yeah. I think it was at the end yeah. of Timothy Leary's um, life or towards the end of his writing books at least when he was saying that he started moving from talking about psychedelics purely and talking and mixing that conversation a lot with um, advancing technologies and machine learning and the things things along those lines. It always brings me to this thing that I heard, uh, I put out a film back in 2008, it was called Esoteric Agenda, and it mentioned the Illuminati, mm -hmm. and it, it kind of went into the Bavarian Illuminati, and then followed some uh, bloodlines through Burke's Peerage, but the main thing was, afterwards, people started sending me this article called The Hidden Hand, and it was mm -hmm. saying, it was talking about the Illuminati, and, and like, it, it, I couldn't tell whether it felt hokey or not, but basically there was this anonymous person that said he was deeply within the Illuminati and was saying that what everyone believes about the Illuminati is not exactly correct, that a lot of the theater that seems to be happening in the world is not to destabilize us for imprisonment, but to, in a sense, push us towards our own evolution. And there's there's a mm -hmm. huge element in there that I, I don't know if I, I don't feel like I resonate with. And then there's an aspect of it that I could see could potentially resonate but like what you're mentioning there as far as like this kind of like flip side of the coin like if ai really was sent by gaia these plants may be the thing for us to see you know almost from the other side of the mirror it might seem like a polar opposite right. and in a exactly. sense perhaps you can't really understand ai without the, you know, maybe without the help of these plants, or at least what these the state of being that these plants 
quicken us into. Because I do believe through like breath work and there are some other things that they can get close to where a psychedelic can take you. Not not all of them are as reliable. Um, but I also find it really incredible that we produce DMT, that anything we can take right. exogenously um, that produces such an effect within us, that means in a sense, if, if I were to use the term, the hardware was there for us to have that experience, um, that there are also probably ways of orienting our state of being, orienting our consciousness. And I do believe that the, you know, the Christ is probably the most prime example of this, of transmuting through inner alchemy a state of being without a need of an external agent, because there is really, it, it may be just a construct to say, look at that plant over there. That's other than me. I need to take it in me to have this experience. Well, maybe it can illuminate mm -hmm. you to show you that this experience is possible, but the experience is right. also deeply embedded within who you are, which mm -hmm. is infinite. Absolutely. Um, you know, when you're talking about the Illuminati, I, I called my uh, 2002 book cloak of the illuminati because i i had read i mean most people were kind of under the influence of the, the sort of the, the david i the illuminati or dark satanic reptilians whatever mm -hmm. um but originally the word illuminati was applied to newly baptized christian initiates wow. and their symbol was a lighted candle and the idea was that you were to understand that the, the candle is your your spinal cord the wick of the candle is your pineal gland and the oil is produced within the pineal gland, and what you need is the the spirit to to light that that candle. And so, once again, it's it's saying it's 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 all within us. And if we're we're demonizing groups of people, sometimes we're going to lose out on the 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 real esoteric meaning of of the secrets that they're said to to have held. And that that's very important for us to 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 acknowledge. And and one other thing that I I always like to point out too is that. I, I am I'm pretty dead set against AI and transhumanism. In fact, I'm 99.999% sure we don't want to merge with AI. And I, I keep that door open, that 0.000001% based on the Catholic Church's position about extraterrestrials. The, the church says, hey, if there's, if there's aliens, we'll baptize them if they show up at the Vatican. Mm. And the Vatican is also on record saying they, they might not look like us. And, and who are we to judge God's creativity, you human bigot, in other words? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm being too bigoted. Maybe I'm being judgmental and saying, hey, maybe God wants us to merge with AI. Maybe God wants us to pack our skin full of any kind of software technology or any kind of hardware technology any of these companies come up with to make trillions of dollars. But I don't think so. Because I think if God wanted us to to uh, be evolving through this technology, He'd already give it to us. It's, it'd be already within us. Yeah, and it's not something we have to add. I, I agree, predominantly because it, this technology, you know, it wouldn't be given through centralized, very elite, technocratic, you know, groups. Right. If this right. really was for and and I constantly come back to this idea of centralization. I get there's there's an argument for centralization, but I, mm -hmm. I constantly see that um I, I guess just staying on topic with AI in particular, I I too agree. I feel like there with our with our ingenuity, I believe there is a way that we could potentially if if we didn't feel the pressure of how fast the technology was rising in the current state, meaning the infrastructure mm -hmm. that will give us our Wi-Fi is destroying in, in the environment at a, you know uh, a ridiculous rate, and with that it seems like it's it's there's not even a care in the world, and you're not allowed to mention it or else you're just a kooky conspiracy theorist. You want to talk about the impact of. Right hundreds of thousands, if not millions of 5G masks. Oh, you know, like go back to your grandma's basement is what I'll hear from people like, whoa, like I I can't talk about that. So we can show Cardi B talking about some of the most grotesque stuff and 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 glorify this kind of this this kind of music. But when I talk about the potential impact of the infrastructure that is basically supporting this 
coming of a brand new era that we're living in, you know, I'm put down for it. So I also agree. And I don't believe that when you say 99.999%, you know, reject AI and transhumanism, I agree. And I love that you, you leave open room for the, the great, whatever, like I'm, I'm fallible, mm-hmm. you know, show me how I'm wrong. Open my eyes. I would love to see that. Right. But, you know, at least for right now, I'm pretty close to it. I'm pretty close to it in its current incarnation because in its current incarnation, it doesn't seem like it corrects the fundamental problems of human existence. It actually exacerbates no. them. And so th- that's it's that's where I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah. And we still have time to do something about it. And um, that that gets back to what we were saying early, these, these daily choices to rely on it less, don't feed the beast. That... I mean, every click is 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 creating the the physical body of the beast of revelation, and so we have to understand that through the power of exponentialism, that that this this conversation that we're having, Ben, there's maybe however many people listening, but if we if the people that are listening tell two people and they tell two people and they tell two people, pretty soon we've got a huge message that's out there, and people are recognizing they have the ability to do something about this and. That's the the important thing is that every day doing something that feeds not the beast, but rather feeds your your future, your higher self, your your whole holy and complete self. Mm. Out of the body of work that you have right now, um, what would you point people towards to begin to begin connecting with what we have available to us? I love how you mentioned the spinal column. So like the lighted candle Mm -hmm. as being the spinal column. Mm -hmm. There's so much spinal column iconography uh, from Jacob's Ladder to even the, um, I think it was was Aaron's staff, correct? That that was the Mm -hmm. brazen serpent or the bronze serpent? Uh, Moses. Moses' staff, but wasn't... Yeah. Okay. Um, Moses, yeah, Moses, Moses made the, the Nehushtan, the serpent on the pole. Yeah. Yeah. And so these were the serpents that were um, basically biting the Israelites. And then the, the Lord told them, raise one of these serpents on a pole. So instead of in the dust, raise it upright, which to me almost sounds like Kundalini um, as totally. well. And the, the same serpents that are killing you will heal you. So it's interesting. It's a reorientation exactly. of the same kind of energy. And the caduceus that we also see, you know, that's, again, dueling serpents rising up and becoming winged at the top of that staff. There's a lot of this spinal right. um, iconography. I would love to hear, um, because I want to dive a little bit more, and you just have so much work. I mean, I was trying to dive into all the stuff that you have on Gaia, which is incredible. Uh-huh. Um, what body of work would you point people at that you would say gives some, um, maybe not, you know, step-by-step, you know, practical instructions, but some kind of semblance of how they can begin working on this light body, for Mm -hmm. one, and also really, you know, focusing on this ascension and what we can do individually without having to need some Mm -hmm. company or some tech. Yeah, I would... uh... I'd recommend my online course on my website, williamhenry.net. It's called Awakening the Pearl, the, the Light Body Teachings of Christ and the Marys. And this is a, a Gnostic, uh, based on a Gnostic text called the Hymn of the Robe of Glory. And it's essentially a, a walkthrough of, of, the, of the, the meditations used by the early Gnostics for manifesting their their light body and it also uh, talks about the soul's journey as well in the in the in the cosmic dilemma that the soul is engaged in while on earth and how it can ultimately return to its its place of origin source reality which as i said a moment ago that that is a, a real key aspect of, of what we've got to be working on right now is, is connecting with that source reality outside of this one and that's what the awakening the pearl is is devoted to hmm I love that. Are you doing any uh, live talks anytime soon? I am. Yeah, I've got, um, I'm part of an Ascension conference in Sedona in March. And then in Nashville, I have my Halo 2.0 event on April 9th and 10th. And this is going to be getting into specifically targeted about sacred plants and Ascension. 
So it's going to be a weekend of lots of art and, and discussion about the use of sacred sacraments and, and the role in, in early Christianity and, and its role in, in other religions and how we can use it today. I love that. That's in Nashville, April 9th and 10th. I'm pretty sure I'll be in town. I would love to. I would love to go out to that. Love to have you, Ben. Yeah. For sure. Anyone listening, if you're in or around the area or want to make the uh, the trek to Nashville, um, April 9th and 10th, Halo 2.0, I think that's going to be um, a glorious one. Um, with that being said, um, mention to the audience any way that they can get involved with like what you're doing now and what's what's soon soon to come. I also want to know what you're like. What's the next publication or thing that you'll be coming out mm -hmm. with? Mm -hmm. So I'm finishing a book about the Essenes and the Light Body, which I hope to have out later this year. I'm also uh, working on a book on uh, on the sacred oils, the the oil of joy and uh, the, the, the sacred sacraments. And that is something I hope to have uh, available later this year as well. So most of the events that I'm doing in the, the second half of the year are all going to be focused on uh, the, the oil of joy idea and, and the sacred plants and ascension. I love that. I, I actually had no clue that you focus so much on sacred plants. I think that's incredible. And I'm really excited for this Halo 2.0. You can see that on the screen right now. Um, this has been wonderful. And you know, what's funny is I didn't even really get to dive into a couple of the things that I really wanted to, we'll have to get you back on. Um, we didn't even go, to, ben. yeah, we didn't even go, uh, ET on this one and Gordo, by the way, he's been following <laughs> you for quite some time and I'm sure, Thank you, Gordo. Okay, yeah, I, I'm quite sure you probably had maybe a few things you wanted to ask. Is there anything you wanted to ask Gordon? <laughs> Oh, I mean, we covered a lot. I mean, I, I kind of mentioned it before the show started, but um, just briefly, kind of your thoughts on sort of the state of disclosure and <clears throat> kind of just, do you feel, yeah, I mean, I'll just kind of leave it sort of simple as that, but sort of just the, the current state and your sort of thoughts moving forward on it. I, you know, I think we're kind of just feel like we're grasping right now um, that, there was so much excitement going into 2020 and in 2021. And, and now we've got a kind of, we're in a yeah. kind of a regroup phase, I think, where we're responding, we're waiting for another shoe to drop. Um, right. we, I feel fairly certain that there's, there's more to come from, from uh, the Defense Department, from the Pentagon later this year. Yeah. And that's, that's where we're at right now is kind of in that space in between. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think... From a lot of people who've talked about it, from Elizondo to Chris Vermel, and it seems like we've seen just a tiny amount of what's really still, yep. you know, they say about yep. like 5% is all we've the, seen. The, the thing I'm excited about about it is like when you look at like the Tic Tac videos that uh, were, were brought out and the engineers that have looked at, at those videos, they they maintain that those those craft are, are projections from a, a higher reality, that they're not part of our 3D reality that they're opening wormholes and using advanced Stargate technology. And that's something that, that deeply interests me. And I've got a, actually an article about it on, uh, called Magical, Magic Bubbles on my website. And I'm trying to match up well, uh, the, the images that we're seeing in the ancient world of the gods traveling in their arcs right. of the millions of years and their magic bubbles with what we're seeing in the Tic Tac video. And it's very interesting. In fact, we're going to have an episode on ancient aliens about my article uh, coming out sometime in the next couple of months. I'm really excited to see what they did with that. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, we've touched on with the indigenous with Stargates. And I think, you know, I'm in the camp that I think this is a very ancient phenomenon that's connected to us. Agreed. Uh, and more than one dimension, yep. you know, to leave it at that. I agree. Yeah. Yep. Well Agreed. done. Yep. Beautiful. Well, William, my goodness. I mean, the, the time flew by. I really, I, I had a whole list of questions here. We'll have to get you back on. I would really also, since we're in the same Anytime. area at some point, I'll connect with you about doing an in-person interview. I do these mini docs Beautiful. and put them on my website. Um, I think that okay. would be, it's, it's high time we start bringing, um, a lot of the wisdom that you've been bringing for quite some time uh, into this kind of mini doc format 
and um, give it really short and succinct because that that gives it a lot of legs on YouTube and the you know, the current Beautiful. state of these content platforms. I really want to thank you for the, I mean, really just to the point, astute kind of research that you've been doing, but without um, negating the spiritual side. I, I see a lot of people, usually when I am researching the type of research that you go into, I, I would have to go to two separate kinds of books. Yeah. And it's really nice mm -hmm. to see somebody marrying the two and um, coming from a spiritual background, but also talking about technology. It's it's rare and mm -hmm. you're doing a really good job of it. So I really appreciate and honor Thank the work you, you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, for everything today, Gordo. It's been such a pleasure and I'll look forward to next time. Perfect. Definitely. Definitely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been great. We're going to have to do this again. This There was so much to dive into. I know that I'm going to have to let this percolate inside me for quite some time before I can develop even deeper questions to ask for next time. I'll even likely do a Waking Infinity News to kind of speak about some of these topics so we can get into it a little bit deeper and get the audience rolling a little bit more on these topics. With that being said, we do this every single Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. I really appreciate you all joining us, and I can't wait to see you again next time on the Ben Stewart Podcast.